This week we're going to talk about thermodynamics. Now, for your uh, chosen profession of funeral directorship, it is becoming more and more important to understand thermodynamics because it is becoming more and more popular uh, to uh, have your loved one's body cremated. And so, as a result, we need to be able to understand how to actually process what's happening throughout the cremation process. And so, thus, we need to really understand what thermodynamics is. And that basically, if we, if we break it down, we have thermo, which involves heat, and dynamics, which is movement. So, heat movement. How does heat move? How is heat transferred? So we can look at it as movement or transfer. So, thermodynamics entails the use of heat power. Power involves how much heat, basically. It's, it's, a, it's a volume, if you will, of heat. If you could put heat in a bottle, that would be heat power. But we need to understand how that volume works because, quite frankly, putting a fire into a container and saying it lives there is quite absurd. So what we need to understand are two interesting vocabulary words. One is the system. System is what you're studying. In the case of uh, cremation, it is the body that is going to be cremated. The surroundings, that's everything else that the system is in. That's all the stuff that's around the system. So in cremation, that's the oven itself. The interior of the oven, all the little grates and the connect and the, uh, the, the, the interior of that oven. All of that is your surroundings. When you start to look at surroundings plus your system, now then we're dealing with the universe at hand. So what we have to really think of in terms of this volume, basically what I'm trying to say is this universe is kind of your volume of uh, heat power. That is how much heat you could actually, you need to make it work. So you need to look at the universe as a whole. It does no good to say, okay, here's this body. It weighs 150 pounds. I need this much heat to uh, completely cremate this body. Well, that doesn't work so well because you also have to heat the surroundings. So you actually need more heat available to do the cremation process than you would think just simply because you have to mess with the entire universe. You can't just look at the body itself. You can't just look at the interior of the oven. You have to look at the both of them system and surroundings so energy even heat is the capacity to do work now work is uh, a a force on something so the way we look at energy is we look at energy so i guess uh uh energy is the um uh, is the work that's done per unit of something. And we look at, oftentimes, the joule because it's the international unit of energy. In the U.S., we still use the British thermal unit, the BTU. Sometimes we call it a calorie. I enjoy confusing the mess out of my children because we look at calories on our... Um, on our snackage, and we might see, 
oh, well, you know, this snack has 100 calories because everything right now is 100 calories. You got to deal with 100 calories. Well, this big C right here, you remember those units back in the day when we were talking about math tools and how they're useful if you use the tool correctly? Well, this is one of those instances where it's been assumed and if you know what's going on, you can use it correctly. If you don't know what's going on, you don't use it correctly. That big C calories is actually 100 kilocalories. <sighs> or if we really want to be fancy schmancy, it's 100,000 calories. So I blow my kid's mind and say, oh, well, look, I'm eating a snack and it's 100,000 calories. Well... Call that a bad chemist joke, but you know, uh, my oldest daughter still to this day comes back and says, is this big C calories or little C calories? Because that's a thing. And if it's a big C calories, then you're doing more, you're transferring more energy, you're using more energy. It's a lot more dense in terms of how much energy is there. Now, while energy is the capacity to do work and joule is the international unit of energy, we need to understand a couple of other things. Energy moves from one form to another. So uh, we can take light, like uh, UV light, and transfer it into heat. If you've ever been out in the sun, you can feel some like, or in a, in a, 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 a tanning bed, you can feel something like that. So it can move from one form to another. So we can take chemical energy that is in the bonds, and we can convert that into heat energy. So you can do a conversion of one thing to another. You can take heat energy and convert that into uh, kinetic energy. You can take that kinetic energy and convert that into electricity. You can do all sorts of these things. But as soon as you do start doing some of this, what you find is something quite peculiar. The energy that you have here, I'm just going to call it a standard 100. I don't care what the units are, I'm just going to say it's 100. When you go over here to convert that into heat energy, you're going to end up with, say, 60. And when you convert that heat energy into kinetic energy, you might end up with, out of that 60, you might end up with 10. And then out of that 10, for the electrical energy, we might end up with 2. So... When looking at this 100 right here to the final 2, if energy can neither be created nor destroyed, what happened to the other 98? What happened to this thing? Well, that's a great question. In the first law of thermodynamics, which is basically says that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, you cannot get more energy out than you put in. You cannot make energy, nor can you just simply lose energy. So here's the deal. This 60, basically what this is saying is the other 40... when converting chemical energy to heat energy, might convert, go convert something into molecular 
motion. So some of it, that other 40% might be converted into the movement of the molecules. They tumble one on each other. Huh, that's interesting. So we still have the 100% there. And now then, of the 60% that's right here, you only get 10% that's converted into the kinetic energy. Where'd the other 50 go? 50 might be lost to your surroundings. Hmm. Heat loss is a thing. It happens all the time. That's why when we're outside in the cold, we get cold. We lose some of our heat. Where did it go? Our bodies produced it. It didn't just disappear. It got dissipated through into the cold. We tried to warm up the atmosphere. Our bodies do that. So you can't just, you don't just lose the energy. What happens is it gets converted to something else. That's all that happens. And what we're looking at whenever we're looking at a chemical energy converting into heat energy, there's all sorts of other energies that can happen. So do you have molecular motion that can happen? Can this occur? with your molecule? Oh, absolutely. Those molecules will start moving because you get in, they're becoming more energetic and they're heating up and so some of that heat moves the molecules. So you get some kinetic motion there of the molecules itself. And then you can't perfectly transfer heat directly into kinetic energy. You're gonna lose some. And so this other 98% that's here it's a little bit of a tricky wiki because, quite frankly, you're not losing 98% of the chemical energy you started with. It's just being converted. Let's, let's put it this way. This 98% here gets converted into an unusable form something we don't care about do we really care about this molecular motion up here nope all i care about is producing the electricity because once i can produce that electricity then i can turn on my lights and if your lights have been out for any number of time any length of time if you've been out of electricity for any length of time that's a bit annoying so that's kind of an interesting thing about this first law of thermodynamics. You can't actually create or destroy energy. You just convert energy. You just convert energy. And you recall from a long time ago, we talked about this thing of E equals MC squared. You remember that? Where E is energy. M is mass of something. And C is the speed of light in a vacuum. And we also talked about this other thing where we said energy is equal to H uh, C over lambda, where you have, let me re rewrite this thing, equals energy. Okay. where H is Planck's constant. C is the, hold on, speed of light and a vacuum again. Lambda is the wavelength of your light. And E, of course, is your energy. Can you set those things equal to one another? Absolutely you can. And so then, whenever you go to solve things, you start to see that this mass corresponds to a wavelength. And so, even with mass conversion to energy, 
you can convert mass to energy without much of an issue. We do that with nuclear uh, fission and nuclear uh, fusion on in the sun anyway quite readily. It's very prolific in the universe, the greater universe. And so what we find is you can convert mass into energy. You're just going to convert some into something that's not very usable. And that's part of the reason why, you know, if any of you are Trekkies out there, that's part of the reason why the transporter technology will likely never, ever happen. Because how do you convert this mass into energy where you're not going to be having any unusable energy conversion and we're going to get 100% return. That's the problem with it. So, there's the first law of thermodynamics. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. I always like to say uh, this. This is a little bit more universal, I think. The sum of all energy in the universe is constant. The sum of all energy in the universe is constant. This generally works quite well, especially for finite type situations such as what you would find in a crematorium. Energy in, it's going to stay in in some form or fashion. All right, so now then, before I go on to the next thing, what we're basically talking about here in this energy is something that's called enthalpy. And enthalpy is specifically dealing with uh, the kind of the energy that's within the system. So you've got uh, a way that you can start to divide out, you can separate out what the system's energy is and what the surroundings energy is. And that is what I call enthalpy. You also have this other thing called entropy. Now this is a, this is a little bit more difficult to kind of work through because this I mean it's the second law of thermodynamics, see? It's the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy basically says uh, in the second law of thermodynamics if you have a process any process the universe becomes more disordered. So entropy is a measure of disorder. So freezing ice cream would appear to violate this law because you take something that is disordered, a liquid, so think about this. You have a uh, uh, if you've ever seen Home, the movie Home, great movie. Bring tissues because it'll make you cry. Here's the example, based loosely on the movie Home. You have in the movie Home they talk about a frozen sweetened bovine secretion that is ice cream okay what if it's not yet frozen and you have a sweetened bovine secretion okay well in the summertime eh not so much awesomeness right but if it's frozen in a sweetened bovine secretion, that becomes something that's, that's beautiful, isn't it? So what you do is you take this, and then you'll put it in 
uh, ice bucket with rock salt. And then it becomes now this thing becomes a frozen sweetened bovine secretion. So what happens here is we go from something that's a liquid, not frozen, and it becomes frozen. To go from liquid to frozen, that says that we are decreasing our disorder. But my question to you is what's happening with the ice and the rock salt? The ice and the rock salt are doing what? The rock salt is helping dissolve the ice. So disorder increases. So this entire bucket right here is my universe, right? Unit. I will be able to spell one day in this world. Universe. This part up here, the sweet and bovine secretion, which becomes frozen, this is my system. The ice with the rock salt and the bucket are my surroundings. So the surroundings have the disorder that increases. The system has a disorder that decreases. But here's the thing. In this case, the size of your surroundings. Remember I said that that heat power is kind of like the volume. The surroundings <clears throat> tend to be bigger than your system. And that's almost always the case. So you use the surroundings to increase your disorder so that your system can become more ordered and you get that beautiful sweet and bovine frozen sweet and bovine secretion also known as ice cream you have to melt the ice to dissolve the rock salt and that takes a disorder loss with the ice melting and a, or a disorder gain by melting the ice and a disorder gain by dissolving the rock salt so, entropy is a measure of disorder. So let's think about this. If we're looking at the first law and the second law of thermodynamics with respect to the funeral business. So the first law, which deals with enthalpy, basically says the heat in must be large enough, must be great enough, must be significant enough to uh, do the cremation. Okay, so the heat in must be large enough to undergo cremation. Okay, what's the second law do? What's the second law say? That one deals with entropy, right? Well, entropy basically is a disorder, right? So the system, that is the body, right, must become more disordered. 
So if we look at this, does the body want to become more disordered? Does it want to degrade and become more disordered? The answer there is yes. It will want to do that. The system will want to do that. Can we, with our crematoriums, adjust the heat, adjust the enthalpy so that we can put enough of that enthalpy, enough heat in to do the cremation? And the answer is yes, we can. Now, here's what's interesting here. This goes back to the, with this first law, because the second law, it makes sense. You got the body will want to dis degrade and whatnot. But when we are looking at this heat, notice it has to be the heat in has to be large enough. So you have reactions that fall into two categories. Reactions are exothermic. Exo means to give off, and thermic means heat. So that means they produce heat. And you have reactions that are endothermic. That means these reactions will not produce heat, but they will absorb heat. So what you find is something interesting that happens here. This overall reactions are either endothermic, where they, uh, where they absorb heat, or they're exothermic. When we're looking at a reaction, let's say we have a reaction of A that becomes B plus C. So with A, we had to break bonds, right? Break bonds to get B and C. B and C, to go backwards, we have to make bonds. So, exothermic, I'm going to put a little star right here. Exothermic is what happens when you're breaking bonds. These bonds give off energy. They produce heat. Endothermic is what happens when you make bonds. So to go backwards, to take B and C and put them together to make bonds, they are going to have to absorb heat in order for that to work. So the process of cremation is a little bit more complicated than you might think. And part of that is due to efficiency. Most of the time, the best efficiency we can get is somewhere between 10, 15 and 40%. That's the best case scenario. The remaining energy is lost as heat. It gets more disordered because to lose something, have you ever noticed this when you lose something in your room? Your room tends to be more trash than normal. Hmm. You see that entropy working? So you get the remaining energy that's lost as heat. Another form of enthalpy. So what do we do? How do we deal with this efficiency issue? Well, we can start to measure some of that. And we can measure it based on temperature. So here's the, the general idea between um, of, of efficiency. Let me, let me come back to efficiency. Efficiency uh, is be basically equal to what, what we need is, um, is directly proportional. Let's put it that way. 
it is directly proportional to your high temperature minus your low temperature. So ambient temperature, room temperature, is going to be sitting right around uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. When we start looking at the high temperature for a crematorium, we're looking at things on the order of 1500 degrees Fahrenheit at least. So by having a very significant temperature differential, what have we done to our efficiency? We begin to optimize it. So when this is maximized, then we get really, really good efficiency. So this means that we need to understand temperature. Temperature is just a measure of the intensity of heat. Uh, it's a measure of the intensity of heat. Um, it's also a measure of kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is just energy due to movement. So let's think about this. If we have a bunch of cells that are in a body that is static, the body is dead, the cells are not moving, it's trying to undergo some sort of degradation process kind of thing, uh, decomposition, then as uh, what we can do is we can put that body into, a, uh, into an oven, into the crematorium, and when we do that, then by turning the heat up, we increase the temperature of the cells. The water in those cells begins to move faster and faster and faster. Remember, temperature is a measurement of the kinetic energy. Eventually, those cell, that cell temperature moves fast enough that the water evaporates and bursts the cell. So now then we're starting to get that uh, uh, volume loss that is important for decomposition. But as you, as we've now lost the low boiling water, we have to increase that temperature further because it's harder to, to get rid of the, uh, uh, to cremate the remaining material. So you got to increase that temperature further. So you have to increase the intensity of heat. And in doing so, then don't we begin to take this T high, the, temp the high temperature minus T low, and this thing gets big. And if this thing gets big, because it is directly proportional to efficiency, then that efficiency then becomes maximized. Now, interestingly, cremation is a very highly regulated thing. Um, and there's a lot of reasons behind that, and I don't want to get into that right now. But you cannot increase this temperature too high as a result of those regulations. So you have to stay within certain boundaries. You can't just maximize your efficiency of your crematorium. And this is part of the reason why uh, there is kind of a, uh, there, there can be a waiting period at this stage of the game because of the nature of the popularity of cremation of late. Now, there are three different temperature scales. The U.S. is one of the few nations that still uses the Fahrenheit scale. And the Fahrenheit scale, as you know, water freezes at 32 and it boils at 212. But in the kind of more uh, standard uh, temperature scale, this is nation, well, not nationwide, but worldwide, the Celsius scale, sometimes old school people call it centigrade, centigrade is from the fact that it goes from zero degrees C for water freezing to 100 degrees C to water boiling. Do you see this? Centi 
grade, centi meaning a hundred. So that's kind of interesting. And then you have this Kelvin scale. Kelvin scale is the absolute temperature scale. This being the absolute temperature scale, it's absolute because basically at zero Kelvin, we get a very little molecular motion. Very little molecular motion. So we can, there are several formulas that you can kind of work with here. To go from Kelvin to degree C, and it's actually Kelvin, not degrees Kelvin. Kelvin is equal to degree C plus 273. Likewise, to get from uh, Kelvin to degree C, you need to do Kelvin minus 273 is equal to degree C. To go from degree C to degrees Fahrenheit, let's do it this way. So you take 9 fifths times degrees C plus 32. I believe that's the way it works. If I have my parentheses in the correct spot. So let me go ahead and check this real quick with you as a nice little example. So if I've got a body, uh, a regular, like my standard temperature would be 37 degrees C. If I take 37 37 plus 32 is equal to Yep, that's wrong. Let's do it this way. So it's 9 fifths times degree C plus 32 to get to degrees Fahrenheit. So this being the case we know that 37 degrees C should be pretty close to 98 degrees Fahrenheit because that's our regular body temperature. So if you do 9 fifths, so you do 9 times 37 divided by 5 plus 32, it gives us 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the correct temperature. So you need to make sure that you remember these two formulas here. Those are gonna be pretty important moving forward. Kelvin is equal to degree C plus 273, and degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 9 fifths degree C plus 32. When we look at these scales all together, it kind of looks like this. Notice that what we have is we've got lots of little degree measures here with the Fahrenheit, but I want you to notice that here The degree measures track from degree C to, to Kelvin. Those degree measures, these things have the same uh, degree, I'm going to call it distance. Does that make sense? So this becomes pretty important in terms of understanding some of these uh, cremation opportunities. Most of the time, 
here in the U.S., we're going to be looking at things in terms of Fahrenheit. But there are some times, especially as we become more international, where the cremation facilities that we have will be measured in Celsius. So sometimes you'll have to do those conversions. And if you can do those conversions, then there are times when you can save quite a bit of money in uh, increasing your capacity for cremation, especially as it becomes more and more popular as time passes. Well, I hope that was a uh, enlightening and introduction to thermodynamics and its application into uh, in, with the funeral directorship.